before we get into the fun stuff, I do have to give you a general advice warning, just saying that nothing in this uh, presentation is tailored to your personal circumstances. So general advice disclaimer. So now done. And with that out of the way, I will move on to what we're getting through tonight. So the first piece is our main event, the great debate. So we've got Team Milk Chocolate to my right. Michael and Stanford Brown team to my left, Aaron and Gemma. <laughs> Fierce competition tonight. Um, so from there, we'll go into an update from SD Finance, Tim Russell, um, giving a chat on interest rates and the consideration for property buying in the current environment. Um, Derek over here to my left gives an update on some tax tips for millennials in the room. Um, and we'll finish the night off, Matt and myself, with a little bit of quiz to see if you are smarter than a financial advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so to kick us off, like I said, we're going to be doing property in this corner. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed judges and fellow debaters. Prepare yourself for a spirited discussion as Brad and I unveil an argument that is as solid as the foundations of a well-built property and as captivating as a real estate listing that states classic charm. Tonight, you'll find out why buying real estate reigns supreme over investing in shares when it comes to unlocking the doors of prosperity and seizing the keys to your financial success. We don't need Harbour Bridge views or flat whites on tap. We just like to keep it simple, like all good property is. Back in 93, you could have invested $273,000 of cash into shares or property. So we picked an ASX Darling CBA, one of the largest banks in Australia, with a long standing reputation for stability and profitability, having consistently delivered strong financial results uh, to its shareholders. So 30 years ago, if you invested that $273,000 of cold hard cash into this ASX listed darling, you'd have picked up just under 31,000 shares at $9 a piece. And today those shares would be valued at just under $97 a piece or just a little under $2,940. And that's a profit just under $2.7 million. So there's certainly no argument here. It's not a bad return at all, but I probably wouldn't yell that too loudly at the, at the Coogee Pabs. Most millennials' values don't align with greedy listed companies. <laughs> but what if you had taken that cash and stood on the footpath in Clover Valley, the winter sun beating down on your face, the fresh sea air filling your lungs, and you purchased a freestanding home? It has no walls attached to your neighbours. There's a white picket fence and a backyard you can even play cricket in. Back in 93, that Australian dream would have also cost you just $273,000. Well, over the past 30 years, your piece of Australia would have increased in value to just over $3,970,000. That's a tidy profit of $3.7 million. You certainly would have hit a six. So let's do the math. For those of us in the room that aren't a financial advisor, there's certainly not that many, but it's really not that hard. Over the 30 year period that home you owned in Clovelly would have outperformed the CBA shares with a percentage difference of 379.71% or $763,610. So not only could you be sitting on your deck right now watching the whales migrate north, you could have also been calling milk chocolate to help you draw on the equity and purchase an investment property to continue your wealth creation. Uh, but as those returns, uh, they are just the average. When you engage professionals such as milk chocolate, our superior asset selection and add value potential to ensure the results are even better. All right. Well, there's no denying Australians love property. 
And when you talk to many young people about investing, it's the first thing that they think of. But really, what is investment? And what is an asset? An asset is something that you purchase that will generate you income and increase in value over time. And investing is the act of buying those assets. So naturally, when we're considering what makes the best investment, we have to start with returns. Returns from investments come in two ways. Income, like rent or dividends, and capital growth, or the profit you make when you sell that investment. If you took a million dollars and invested it in the average Australian property, you could expect to receive $39,000 in rent for the year. From that, you would pay fees of around $20,500, $20 leaving you with about $18,500 for the year. But if you took that same $1 million and invested it half in the top Australian 200 companies and the other half in the top 5,500 companies in the world, you would have earned $34,700 or 88% more than if you had have invested in property for that year. The capital gains I hear you say. Well, since 1980, <laughs> since 1980, uh, Australian property has been the lowest performer when compared to Australian shares, global shares, or US shares as well. It's returned just 5.66% per year. But as, they, as Michael said, uh, Australian property, it's not average. There's no such thing as an average return. 50% of people will outperform, but 50% of people will also underperform the average. And when you have property, you just have one shoe. You have all of your eggs in one basket. And it really is a spin of the wheel of fortune. <laughs> you may have been really lucky. You, have, you may have bought this place on the left and you have done very, very well over those last 11 years. Or you may have bought the place on the right and you've really made a big loss. These two properties are just one hour away from each other. They're in the same general region in Queensland. And the one that has done worse is the one that's close to the water and closer to Brisbane. <laughs> I can assure you, no one buys property on a whim. Everyone thinks that they are smarter than average. And everyone thinks oh, they're buying property with potential upside. The truth is to win big, you need to buy the right house in the right street, in the right property, in the right city, at the right time, and you have to have a sprinkle of luck in there too. Compare this with shares. We have a guaranteed average return. Here we have a heat map of the ASX 200 over the last year. The bright green are the winners in each sector and the dark brown are the losers. If you were investing in the whole of the ASX 200, you would have had both winners and losers, but it wouldn't have mattered because you're, you still would have doubled your money in over that 10 year period because you could be just invested in all of them. You wouldn't have to pick the winner and you wouldn't have the chance of picking the loser. Well, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. I um I traditionally don't speak with notes, but for this to keep on time, I'm going to. But I really want to deviate from my notes based on Chairman's observations here, but I'm not going to do that. So, uh, it's my turn. Uh, so my, uh, my esteemed colleague so eloquently uh, sort of positioned our, our observations with regards to property investment from a financial perspective, but leading into what those on the, uh, uh, the opposite to affirmative uh, have, have observed, <laughs> we wanted to talk a little bit more about the reasons why, and I think Gemma's helped us out a little bit more than what she was expecting. Uh, so let's focus on some of those key considerations. Uh, about why property is such a superior investment choice. And what this all comes down to is us as human beings. Uh, and so I was going to do an exercise, but I'll go over time if I do this exercise. What we need to think about is how 
to psychology behind buyer behaviour. It's a really important factor specifically related to property. So the first thing that we need to focus on is that when people look at purchasing anything, they will commence that journey with a logical budget in mind. However, once you start that journey and you find something that you fall in love with, all of a sudden you start to transition into an emotionally driven decision-making process. And once you do that, effectively, your uh, the, the additional spend that you will spend over and above your original logical budget is traditionally been between 10 to 20%. So that mightn't translate too bad for handbags, but when you're talking about a million dollar house, that's potentially $200,000. And this will all make sense in a second. Um, and buying a home, as I was just about, as I was just talking about, is one of the finest examples of this behaviour. And the reason is it's built into our psychology as human beings. And it's also an interesting separation point from the difference between property and shares. When you're purchasing with such uh, well-regarded, uh, not that you're buying shares through financial planners, however, when you're purchasing shares, the only people who purchase shares are investors. There are tools and resources to ensure that you're doing nothing but paying market value for that asset. And that is a contrast difference between that and property. And one of the key reasons why property is such an emotive thing to purchase comes down to this. This is something you've probably all seen before. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The needs at the lower end of this spectrum have to be met before we can, tra we can transition ourselves into the higher sense of being as humans. And interestingly enough, the physiological needs that sit alongside our effort to breathe and drink water and clothe ourselves is shelter. So as human beings, we need shelter. And then the next layer above talks about the safety and security needs that we have in humans. And I didn't put this, this is published, you can Google it. Property <laughs> in bold sits immediately above our need because it ties into this entire concept that we have as humans for shelter. And this all leads into this thing that we call the great Australian dream. And it's because as human beings, we need to satisfy these needs and property is one of the key considerations for the reasons why we need to do that. And ultimately then, so why property? And I will read my notes for this little section because I haven't remembered at all. But effectively, uh, when investing in property, you need to avoid falling in the same pitfall, pitfalls of everybody else, right? You can't become emotionally connected. You need to make commercial decisions. So you may need to engage professionals to assist you with that. That is a sales pitch. But to conclude, a correctly selected asset in the right location satisfying all of the real estate fundamentals is a, huge, is a highly unique and proven asset class underpinned by the basic requirements of our needs as human beings uh, and creating strong and going demand for unforecastable potential premiums, making its exclusion from any wealth creation strategy an irresponsible one and one that shouldn't be considered. And ultimately, the example that Gemma showed us is when someone got it wrong and when someone got it right. And so all you've got to do is just make sure you get it right. This is like Thanks, Brad. I don't need luck, but um, thank you anyway. Oh, you Microsoft, Sabotage. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need luck, thank you. Uh, so look, um, that was a, a wonderful pitch there by Brad, just in terms of uh, why property might be good. And I'm not here to pull things out of psychology textbook. Uh, but what I am here to do is remind that the, the purpose of tonight is the debate whether property is the best investment. So I think we can all agree that, you know, you want to be living in a place, you want somewhere to live. But when it comes to investments, uh, it might not really be the best choice. Uh, and the first reason for that, um, as Gemma alluded to, is shares often, uh, often offer uh, superior performance uh, in terms of not only just income and capital returns, but also diversification. But we can take that a step further. And when we actually look at well, what are the barriers to entry in terms of getting into the market? And I think we can all agree that shares are quite easy to get into. Um, now, in fact, you can start a share portfolio with as little as $500. Um, and if you're going down the pathway of micro investing, that could be as little as one cent. Now, uh, you definitely can't do that with property. If you can, I'd love, uh, love to see that. Uh, but not only that is it easier to get into, property is the complete inverse or the complete opposite, where it's going to take a significant amount of your money just to get into the market. So if we consider the median property price of a million dollars and the standard deposit you know, we're going to need at least $200,000 just to get out of the gate. But on top of that, think of things like stamp duty, 
And this is not just a, a once-off cost. If you ever change your mind or want to buy another property, you're going to be incurring this cost over and over again. And on top of that, you've got things like title fees, mortgage registration fees, conveyancing fees. So you take that million dollar property and you're going to need at least $243,000 just to get to the starting line. Now, as I said, we only need $500 with shares. And so when we think about that, we're effectively removing that hurdle. So imagine how easy it would be just to, you know, go at the start line and walk breezily up to the finish line. And, you know, it'll feel a little bit like this. <laughs> Compared to property, all that hurdle, all that red tape, it's a very complicated process and very costly. And it's going to leave you feeling a little bit like this. Uh, but that's not all. Once you get into the property, you're going to be paying very substantial ongoing costs. Now, again, let's reconsider that $1 million property. Um, with, and as Gemma said, a typical yield of maybe 3.9% on that. But once you start deducting all of those costs, our ongoing costs um, you know, well exceed more than half of what we're bringing in for rent. And that brings our net income down to about $18,000 from the starting almost $40,000 that we experienced. And now this, isn't, this is not even including the cost of owning debt. So if you think about a situation where you put down 20% and you borrow the other 80%, under standard interest rates at the moment, around 6%, you're actually gonna be in the red about $2,500 per month. Now we can take that a step further and shares offer a lot of stability uh, and more importantly, certainty. So unlike shares, imagine you buy the property of your dreams, right? You're living in it, uh, or maybe it's for investment. And before you know it, time goes on and you discover there's gonna be some problems. Now, I'm sure we've heard stories, but you start looking at these problems, you try to fix them. And before you know it, you know, you're looking at the roofs, something else has gone wrong. You've got, you know, cases of plumbing gone awry. And before you know it, it looks a bit like this. <laughs> that complete disaster, complete renovation, and there goes your budget. So remember, unlike property, with shares, we can get in very, very cheap. We get a solid, consistent long-term return, and we don't have to worry about you know, renovations. It's very hassle-free. Uh, it makes all of our lives easy. So thank you. Compelling arguments from both sides. We'll now have three minutes from the property team and three minutes from the shares team to persuade you. They're stressed, crumbling under pressure. <laughs> I was trying to get us to a neutral slide instead of being. No, 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 that's better. Leave it like that. <laughs> now, why is property so good, Brad? <laughs> Again, requirement to do the extra notes because. <laughs> We've got three minutes. I'll be I'll try and be quick. Why is property so good? Was a question that just came from uh, the uh, adjudicator because this is done by. Because I can guarantee you that if that house is in the right street, in the right location, with the right land size and the correct aspects, there will be people who will pay just as much money for that in the finished product because of the emotional connection it creates. And when you get most of those people put into competition, emotionally connected purchases unforecastable premiums of the result. So a couple of confusing points with regards to uh, our competitors to my left is we're talking about stability, okay? Uh, what happens when the, uh, when the, I put this in the context, Sydney's property prices have retracted by about 13% from the peak. Okay, so the peak from the COVID peak to the, the, the trough, which was effectively January, 2023. 30%, uh, that's a, almost an entire year. Uh, if Elon Musk decided to tweet something about a particular share, there is a very strong risk that you lose 13% in a day. So if we're talking about stability, 
I think we're less exposed to the property market being uh, insta instable in comparison to our share market. The other interesting consideration that the uh, opposition raised here was a barrier to entry. I anticipated that this was going to be an issue. And if you take a very uncreative or non-creative approach, uh, yes, you do need to fund at least 20% of your purchase to avoid lender's mortgage insurance. However, Tim was here. Um, there, there is. Uh, however, as Tim may be able to identify, there are alternate methods to fund that 20%. A lender will only need to see that 20% to avoid lender's mortgage insurance if it's not secured by another source. So you can still secure, and I can't offer you financial advice, but you can still secure 20% of your purchase price against another asset uh, to ensure that you can fund the entire purchase by debt. Good luck trying to fund 100% of your share portfolio on debt. Because the banks prefer property. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I did it to you again. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, why do you want to invest? Is it because you missed your true calling to be a property manager or a real estate agent or a handyman, or because you have a passion for managing your business? If so, property investing might be for you. But maybe the reason you want to invest is to have an additional income stream beyond your nine to five. You want to work with your money just once and then have your money work for you ongoing with the least amount of effort. If you're a used to build up, you should be fo focused on performance, simplicity, and spreading your risk. Um, as our lovely milk chocolate team has talked about, you know, there are absolutely uh, cherry picking. Uh, cherry picking stocks or cherry picking properties that you can say, this is outperformed well above and away what we have shown you here today. But if you invested just $10,000 in Apple 20 years ago today, you would have over six and a half million dollars. If you invest 10,000 in Tesla just 10 years ago, you would have over a million dollars. Talk about low barrier to entry and high upside. <laughs> The other thing that we were talking about is absolutely there is volatility in share investing, which comes back to my point of diversification. You can own a broad range of shares, a broad portfolio, and it cushions that risk for you. There's not going to be any unexpected calls for cash because the hot water system's blown up. You need to replace it. Your tenant moves out. You have a few weeks where you have to cover the rent. Could be a few months. There's a lot of unexpected costs that you could take the fall for if your investment is a, is a property. And uh, just to refute a few more points that the uh, opposing team made, <laughs> um, while you might be able to get into a property with absolutely no deposit, you're still going to have to pay that stamp duty, that pesky, pesky stamp duty. So again, let's revisit that $1 million property. You're going to be paying $40,000, right? Or roughly 5%. Now, Buying that same share portfolio, uh, you know, it's going to cost you a fraction of that. In fact, it's one eighteenth uh, the holding cost just to get into the shares. And as Brad said, sure, you might not be able to go out and borrow the full amount, but even if you just took the deposit or a fraction of that, you could get started for as little as twenty dollars in terms of the holding cost for those shares. Um, and on top of that, going back to the Clavelli point, you know, if you wanted to get into a Clare Valley today, you're going to be paying upwards of that $3 million that we saw. So while that might have worked in the past, again, we're just increasing those barriers to entries. And again, on a $3 million property, stamp duty is going to be very, very expensive. So to conclude, while property certainly has its merits, we do feel that shares present a very compelling case to be the ultimate investment option. And that's due to the low cost, low barrier to entry, and ultimately a very hands-free and hassle-free approach. So when we weigh up all the options, it becomes very evident that shares are the more favorable investment option. Do you want to say anything? No, no, no okay, good, thank, thank you. you. All right, tough today. Maybe if you need to keep them on slide any longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's tough. We've been uh, discussing over here in silent whispers who who could possibly be a winner. Um, 
Too tough to call, I would say. Um, you know, really, really tough arguments on both sides. Um, my, my thoughts would be diversified portfolio, a bit of property, a bit of shares, is probably going to be the winner long term. No boots, okay. Um, but what I thought would be a bit more fun is if we got a Chiro meter going, getting you guys involved. So because they started the property team, Milk Chocolate. <laughs> All right, well then that's pretty strong, but shares, Team Stanford Brown. Yeah! Woo! Yes! So, the first part of the wins. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to bring on Tim, give us an update on the interest rates, and now that's all uh, back in the property market. There you go, sir. Quick up. Thank you, Sanderson. Well, uh, that was a very fun, uh, enthusiastic presentation. Sorry, guys. I, I like the shares as well. Um, uh, I, I don't have uh, heaps of cool stuff to talk about. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a tough 12 months, you know. Um, uh, we, we, we've seen the cash rate go from, you know, such an amazing long run of 0.1% uh, to now 4.1%, uh, which is the highest increase we've ever seen back to back. Um, it might have been completely slow 94. So uh, yeah, I've been updating this this slide sort of every month and it's just getting harder and harder to do this presentation. But here's my here's my attempt to just bring it into perspective a little bit is that if we just if we pull back the cash rate to back to 1995, um, now we're we're at about average of what it historically has been. So so that that's that's something to to, to think about. Um, uh, and the, the reason why we're here, um, there's a number of different factors. Uh, it, it can be slightly complicated, but to simplify it, the main reason which we all know about is, is, is this issue with inflation, which is a global issue uh, as well. It's not just Australia. Um, uh, inflation, uh, I've been, I was reading, every month I talk about like where rates are going to go, and I, I go off the economists, and uh, they, they do me wrong every time because uh, back in December, we were, they were suggesting maybe one rate rise, but probably not uh, any more rate rises, but uh, I've stopped doing that uh, from now on. But look, inflation has been tracking nearly, nearly at 9% and they've got to be able to find a way to tackle that. So uh, until we can get this under control, we're going to have issues where, where we're at. Um, although what I can say is that it appears based on the RBA's forecasting that we're probably, hopefully, about at the end of, of that of that peak cycle. So um, I, I heard the ANZ economists say on, on the radio here that there might be one or two left, but um, surely there wouldn't be more than that as, as a punchy man. So, <laughs> so if, if, we, if we look into the forecast for the, the medium term, three to five years, the, it, we should have done enough to tackle inflation, which would hopefully mean that, you know, we're, we're right at that peak of where things are at now. So in saying that, um, it, it's... Uh, that's good. This is the mortgage rate presentation. So it's it's good to know what is a good rate. Um, and again, this is something that I'm not really great at because it changes every month. But um, what I what I've just given you is just a, a broadly rough um, summary of variable uh, it, P and I interest only, which most people know there's different rates associated with those into fixed rates for owner occupied and fixed rates for investment. Um, you know, as you can see now, broadly you know, five and a half to sort of 5.8 is the new, like two to 2.3 or what it used to be. Um, the, the, the thing that, that I'm seeing that's quite different as from what I what this said was six months ago is there was about a 1% difference between fixed and variable, fixed being much higher than variable. So for a lot of people, you were only considering doing fixed. However, at the moment, they're quite comparable. They're, they're around about the same. Um, which I, which can make things a bit harder to, to do in terms of making a decision. Um, if you wanted maybe my opinion, uh, it looks to be that long term we're going to see rates go down. Medium term, it looks to be pretty volatile. There might be a few more left in us. So considering to fix a portion of your loan maybe for one or two years, given the fact that fixed rates are now starting to be lower than variable, seems to be not a bad idea. Uh, for the last 12 months, I've only been doing variable for people, um, but I've, I've noticed the last the last few months, a lot of my clients are, are looking into fixing uh, consumer moves. It's just something to think about. Um, okay, uh, 
I, I did this graph last week because I wanted to see how bad things were with, with terms of borrowing capacity calculators. So I, get, I did an example of a couple, uh, both on 100 grand, they've got a couple of kids, they've got a credit card with 10K and they've got a car loan um, that costs about 600 bucks a month. Now, if we did this in 2020, uh, where rate was about 2 point something percent, they could borrow, so I'm not talking about purchase price, just the loan itself, 1.1. Um, mm-hmm. When I did that this month, uh, into an adjusted calculator is about 750 grand. So it's, uh, it's, it's not surprising to see that it's about a 32% reduction in terms of what your borrowing um, capacity is. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom because if you're looking to get into the market, uh, it's not a bad time to, to look to, to come in now. For people who have bought you know, recently or in terms of timing, just, just before things started to increase, you know, it would be quite stressful at the moment. It is for a lot of people. Um, but going into the market now, you know, it, consider that this might be the, the start of the, the next cycle. But what I'm trying to sh- demonstrate with these few graphs is that historically, your house prices have very much been linked to people's borrowing capacity. The more that you can borrow, the more uh, the more availability that you have to, to go for a higher price property, the more competitive it is. And that, seem, that seems to see house prices increase. The, the, the graph on the left is, is housing loan commitments and unsurprisingly, they've really increased over the past 12 months, which based on the middle graph, which is a long-term historical view about how, how debt has been very much linked to house prices, the, the, the third graph sort of covers that piece off to, to suggest this is like a month on month average of what's happening. So it's not to say properties had like such a huge decrease, but it's certainly the trend of recent months is that things are going down. Um, but of course it depends, it really depends on what suburbs um, that you're looking at. But if you just look at Australia as a whole, um, you, you, would, you would think that as people's capacity decreases, there's less demand and we'll start to see, particularly with, with people getting forced to sell their, their, their homes based on mortgage stress, we should see their property prices decrease. So you might be able to get a bug. Um, uh, in terms of w- what to think about when you're currently looking for a property right now, this has been a dramatic, uh, very difficult challenge for people buying properties because interest rates have been changing every single month. So whatever you, the bank looked at your at your borrowing capacity at one interest rate, when it moves to an, another, obviously decreases. So there's been significant issues with the banks in terms of there's uh, volume constraints that they have to deal with. And a lot of banks aren't even doing a, a genuine pre-approval. They just do what's called an auto approval. And the problem with an auto approval is that they don't hold they don't hold you to whatever they approved you at. So what we've seen is that people that maybe who didn't get a pre-approval or got an auto approval, when they finally purchase the property, they end up getting declined because no one assessed the application at the time. So what has been really important for me when I'm talking to, to people who are going, you know, who are caught, uh, pushing it to the limit in terms of what their borrowing amount is, is that you've got to get a genuine pre-approval, a manual assessment. And the reason why you do that is because even if rates increase between, between the time that your loan was approved to when you find a property, as long as it's within usually a 90-day period of getting the pre-approval, they'll still honour whatever the rate was that they assessed you at at the time of application. They won't give you the, the better rate, but uh, they won't look at your, your serviceability again, so you'll be able to get the property. So it's a really, really important thing at the moment. Um, in terms of, just to, just to finish things off, what to do with, with future proofing your home, thank you. <laughs> um, look, it, it's pretty standard stuff, but um, having a cash buffer, making sure there's, there's money in your offset account, um, staying ahead of, of that borrowing capacity issue in terms of if we think rates are going to be uh, increasing like certainly for what I've been looking at is to people is to say let's not push it to right on the limit so it serves by one dollar be a bit conservative and pull it back a bit um, because likely hopefully prices will probably go down so whatever you thought you couldn't get um, as prices start to decrease you might be able to still get the top of property that you're after um, to, just to, 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 to finish things off in terms of where we're sort of seeing things with lenders going forward is Personally, I'm happy about this, but an end to cashback offers. Um, there was very much, all the banks have been super competitive with each other, trying to offer people um, these, these cashback incentives to move across. And there was a bit of, um, there's a bit of games going on over there. But as of, there's only a few lenders doing it still this month, but I think they've been forced by APRA to not do it at the end of this month. So but that's going to be gone. But what we will see, when we have a time where, it, where interest rates are high and people uh, and, the, and demand is low, because banks are for-profit organisations, they need to figure out ways to, to, to continue to lending. And what we'll see, which we have seen, is just a trend of banks being a bit more lenient with policy. Things like taking 100% of overtime, 
less cash out restrictions, um, taking, uh, taking six months commissions rather than two years. These are sort of trends that we're probably going to see moving forward. Thank you very much. Turn the mic off. I uh, do not. I do not. <laughs> Thank God. I do want to look like Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Oh, I should probably grab the mic. Hey. Hello. Uh, great. Everyone can hear me. Great. Uh, I'm Gary Bolton. I work for the accounting team at Stanford Brown. Great to be up here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're running a little bit over time, so I'm going to try and speed a little bit through it. But quickly, we've got just an outline for you guys. We're going to talk about the federal budget changes that were introduced, um, big uh, changes in the deductions that you can claim, and as well, just going to touch on a little additional general deductions as well. Let's get into it. All righty. So the first big thing that's going to disappear is your low middle income tax offset. So that's been completely stripped uh, after the budget was introduced. And what this means is that if you earn anywhere between $37,000 and $126,000, you're not going to get that extra offset of $675 to $1,500. It's a scale. And uh, what this means is that at the end of like financial year 23, you're going to be looking to pay a little bit more tax. So it's very important to be able to claim a lot as, uh, as many deductions as you can. Uh, I will note that the low income tax offset, which is available up to $66,667, is still included, but it's not that much. Um, moving on, self-education expenses. Originally, self-education expenses, um, you couldn't claim the first $250 that you uh, incurred. And what this means is that if you paid for a textbook and the textbook, let's say you paid three textbooks and you know, the textbooks total up to like $300. That first $250, you can't include in your tax return. You can only include that extra $50, all right? Now, what they've done in the uh, budget is they've removed that $250 threshold. So any expenses that you incur for self-education, you can now deduct. However, there are some requirements for self-education expenses. First off, there needs to be a sufficient nexus with your current employment. And what that means is that if you're working a retail job and you're currently studying to be an accountant, Unfortunately, you won't be able to claim any of your course fees. However, if you are working at an accounting firm and doing you know, an accounting degree, you can claim your course fees. It's great. <laughs> Another thing is that you can only claim it if it's not reimbursed. If it is reimbursed, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to claim the deduction. Now, moving on, big change to work from home, okay? Everyone loves working from home, yeah. <laughs> um, first thing, as we know last year is that there's a bit of a lax substantiation ruling. And the substantiation is that you could just supply the ATO if they asked you a four week diary, and that would be applicable to your whole year. Um, that's gonna change come the 1st of March, 2023, and they're gonna require more substantiation. Uh, first off, before I get into the more substantiation required, let's just have a look at what work from home covers. Work from home, the, the deduction itself, now covers internet and mobile phone usage, gas and electricity costs, stationary and computer consumables. Now this is important because for the more substantiation required, you're gonna to have to provide at least one invoice for each quarter. I mean, sorry, one invoice for one quarter for each of the utilities that you incur that you want to claim. Additionally, that four week substantiation diary that the ATO would ask for, you now need to provide a diary recording every single day that you work from home from your start to your finish time. Now the ATO has a few examples on their website, one being that you can just chuck it into your work calendar. You say, hey, everyone from work, I work from home this day. I start at this time, I finish that time. Everyone can see your calendar. It's a little bit weird. Um, otherwise you can you know, just create a little spreadsheet at home and you can record it that way. The ATO is happy with that as well. Now, superannuation. A lot of uh, financial advisors love talking about contributing to your super. Now there's a bonus here is that you can actually claim a deduction if you contribute to your super. There's two ways kind of to claim, uh, to claim a deduction. First off is your salary sacrifice arrangement that you can arrange with your employer. And I like to say that it leads to an artificial deduction because a lot of time when we're preparing our clients' returns, they'll talk to us and they'll say, oh, hey, you haven't you know, accounted for my salary sacrifice. And I have to explain to them, mm, we did. It's just, you don't actually physically see it. It's just taken away from your actual like, salary that's recorded. And they go, ah, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Now, voluntary concessional contribution, you actually have a voluntary concessional contribution cap of $27,500 each year. However, this is gonna be uh, 
deducted by your, uh, your super guarantee charge that your employer pays. Now it's not automatically included as a deduction. If you wanna do a voluntary concessional contribution, you have to talk to your super and you say, hey, I wanna donate this amount. I wanna uh, contribute this amount. And they'll go, okay, great, it's contributed, but you also need to follow up and say, hey, I want to claim it as a deduction. And you arrange that by claiming a notice of intention to claim, NOITC. Lovely. Um, I would love to get into the timing issues, but unfortunately I'm getting timing issues of myself, so we're gonna move on. <laughs> Lovely. Theme of the night, investment property versus shares. Let's talk a little bit about investment property expenses. Okay. Now we have a long list of deductions for investment properties, as I believe No Chocolate touched on earlier. You can, oh, actually, I think it was Stanford Brown talking about the deductions. But um, the biggest thing that people love to hear about investment properties is negative gearing. Huge buzzword, people love it. And uh, how to do that is that your expenses for your rental uh, exceed your income for your rental. And to do that, you wanna claim as much deductions as you can. So you can claim it on your interest, which is a very large amount. You claim it on your land tax or renter's insurance, uh, capital works as well, um, et cetera. There's a long list. But the biggest thing to note is that there's an increased risk of negative gearing this year. And what I mean about that is that there's increased ATO compliance. The federal budget introduced $90 million of funding for the ATO to chase down problem areas. They noted that they had a $1 billion tax gap from rental properties in the past year. So what areas they're targeting are your initial repairs, your generally available to rent, any undeclared income, and maybe overstated deductions. Now the ATO is kind of looking to have a $450 million increase of tax paid from the $90 million they invest. Now, what can you do to make sure you don't get caught up by the ATO? Main thing is just maintain your clear and concise records, keep it for five years. That's as far as back to the ATO can ask you. Approach your tax return like you will be audited. It's the easiest way, you know? And uh, last thing, use a tax agent if you're unsure, because they'll give you that extra sense of security. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome job, Garrick. Thank you. Um, now the, the fun part of the evening, the test, the quiz, where are you paying attention? All right, so we're going to switch over the screens. Everyone needs to get their mobile phones out and we're going to join a quiz through Kahoot. You're going to put in a little pin. <laughs> Oh, one bit of music for us. All right, so who's used the Kahoot recently? These were very popular during the pandemic. <laughs> this is the fun part of the evening, the quiz. So we're going to pay, see how much you're paying attention. So we've got some uh, questions. Now oh, I wish uh, Jack didn't give away the answer to the first question in his uh, talk a few moments ago. Well, don't. <laughs> Uh, so this is where you get an opportunity to, um, and I always find this quite interesting to see whether people use their actual names or a funny nickname. Uh, Just so you we know. do have a prize. So we're going to give away a bottle of wine and a gift card for the winner today. So if you come up with a funny name, a superstar, anything like that, you're going to have to come up and, and collect your prize. So uh, we will see who superstar is if that's, if that's you. So, oh, so good luck. <laughs> I can see number one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll give it a couple of minutes just to give everyone an opportunity. We're going to just pop up 15 Fourth questions one. on the screen, um, a random selection of different types of questions that we sort of deal with on a day to day basis. <laughs> what is time? <laughs> All right, is everybody in? Hand up if you're not secured no okay we're still figuring out okay you go a minute left and then we're going to start i should say all right so we got the questions here we just got one 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 yeah jojo okay imagine that I think that's what All right. We sorted. Dean, you good? All right. Okay. Three, two, one. Bang. We're in. All right. And you get bonus points for being quick, by the way. So be correct and quick. 
So this is inspired by the TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Uh, so, here we go. Okay, so the first question, what are the current concessional contribution levels? So uh, this is where we had a little bit yeah, of- Easy one to start you off. <laughs> Five seconds remaining. Starting off with something nice and easy. Ooh. And fantastic, so majority got that correct. Um, There's a leader, boys. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Question number two. So, as of 20, October 2021, uh, income protection now covers you for what percentage of your income? So, we have the options there being 60%, 70%, 75%, and 95%. So, not including your superannuation, what percentage of your income can you now cover under an income protection policy from 1 October 2021? <laughs> Okay, nice. That's a differentiator there. We've got a few different responses. 70% is, is the correct answer there. Widening of the field. All right. Expand it. <laughs> okay, so which actor entered the World Cup of Trading Championships as a 17 year old, winning the competition with a return of over a thousand percent, a result that has not been beaten? In fact, only two people in the history of the competition have since been that result, and one of them was the actor's father. So Michelle Williams from um, Dawson's Creek fame. So her father, Larry Williams, is a commodities trader, had an 11,000% return and uh, taught his daughter how to trade as a 17-year-old. He gave her his blessing to become an actor as long as she knew how to make money and uh, looks like she did a pretty good job of it too. Uh, the next one, FTSE 100. FTSE 100 tracks the top 100 companies in each location. T Rex is looking good. We're up next. Okay, we're up next. What does ASIC stand for? They're all believable. <laughs> Safety and insecurity. Always see if you're in doubt. Google. Oh, it's from Arthur. Two people on What does it mean when we refer to green investments? <laughs> Two seconds go. <laughs> Pretty easy that one, I thought too. Good work. The majority. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Tim, you should know this one. How often does the Reserve Bank of Australia meet? We've got 12 times a year, 13 times a year, 11 times a year, nine times a year. <laughs> 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 Fantastic, the majority got that. So they do meet 11 times skip a year, they skip uh, just the one month. Oh, a little shake up. Potential <laughs> leader. Right, true and false, everybody. Only two options here. So true or false question here. So in Norway, income tax records of all citizens are public records and can be searched by any person. Is this true or is this false? 50 50 shots here. Is current? Is it current? This is definitely current. 
<laughs> True is the correct answer. Yes. So um, the, the biggest change here is you've always been able to log on and see anyone's income in Norway. In 2014, they did make a little bit of a change, though. So it become a little bit less Facebooky and a little bit more LinkedIn, if that's a word. So basically, in 2014, uh, they now you can search anyone's income still, but it lets the person know you've looked at their income. And, um, so it tells them it says. Garrick looked up his income. And uh, you know, because of that, less and less people are searching other people's income. And income inequality has never been greater in Norway than, than now. In fact, uh, the Oslo School of Economics has just published a, couple, a paper a couple of weeks ago where they're uh, lobbying to have that little bit removed there because uh, they're arguing that transparency is the key to equality, income equality. So uh, yes, you can search by a person's name. You can also type in your postcode and see who's owning the most of your postcode. You can type in the year of birth. <coughs> Everything is public over there, so there you go. Question 10. Mortgage rates. When was the last time the RV cash rate was above four percent? Damn it, Brad. <laughs> Four seconds left. Oh, here we go. Oh, 2012. Oh, competition at the top. Next question for us. Fasting, fastest growing suburbs in New South Wales from five years to March 2023. How does it have any other Go to All right, question twelve. How much will a 35 year old earning 150,000 gross income with a salary increase of 3% around? Huh? No donations. Oh, man. Do quick maths. Oh, yes. Just guess. Yeah. 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 7.1 million dollars, it's a serious sum of money there. All right, next question. We'll to the uh, scoreboard towards the end. When was negative gearing introduced in Australia? We've got four options, 1980, 1985, 1990, and 1992. Really bad for <laughs> 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 Right, 1985 is the winner there. Oh, change of the leaderboard. T Rex Raw number second. Three questions to go. So there's still a chance for anyone on that leaderboard to win. Okay. Diversification is a time honored way to manage risk in an investment portfolio. Nobel Prize winner laureate Harry Markovitz and Stanford Brown's own chief investment officer, Nick Ryder, agree that diversification is dot dot dot. And I've heard Nick say this a few times. Joey, could be good here. All right, I've got two questions left. What did Albert Einstein once call the eighth wonder of the world? And then, and the final question. Okay, final question, everyone. Quick, we got your figures. All right, here we go. From 1990 to 2020, the price of gold appreciated by approximately in total. 30 years. 
<laughs> Five seconds left. <laughs> All of the questions were fact checked. <laughs> All right, here we go. Silver medal goes to Joey. Winner. 10 out of 15. Joey. Yeah, we'll get <laughs> oh, oh, stuff member Joey. Surely, surely we got to be newest staff members. <laughs> Great way to embarrass him. Okay. Yeah. 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 Who is second? Who is second? Joe. Yeah. There you go, man. He was quicker. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> duke it out, fight it out. <laughs> There's two prizes, so you can fight for it. <laughs> Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So that's us done for the night, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. It's been great to have you all here. If you're free to join us for a drink, we've got a booking at the Angel Hotel from 7 30 onwards. 7 30 onwards. Uh, which is any minute now. So there are still finger food and drinks coming out for the next half here. an hour. And uh, we'd love to uh, take any questions you've got. Um, thank you very much for coming and supporting our events. We love having all of you here. Thank you so much.